Okay, so we'll pick up where we left off. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about a topic called projective geometry um, that may seem super random and unrelated to constraint uh, design, but it has everything to do with constraint design and is one of the most useful things to learn with uh, mechanism uh, design as well, just in general. So uh, stick with me here. It's really weird stuff. Um, that'll just really make your head spin, um, but it's, it's pretty cool. So, okay, um, okay, so consider this uh, flexure here. You can see it's grounded on this end, grounded here, and uh, it's rotating around this axis that I draw as a red line here. So I'm gonna draw it as a more solid red line and call this a rotation line, okay? So um, we're basically going to draw our, our rotate. Remember from lecture two, we, we uh, twists with pitches of zero are drawn as red lines and they're pure rotations. That's exactly what we're talking about here. This is a twist with a pitch of zero. Um, and you can see how that corresponds to uh, everything moving. That's the twist corresponding to this rigid body, how it's moving, okay? Okay, so, so there's that convention there. You can see how the twist with the pitch of zero works. Okay, um, so here's a mechanism with two, um, you know, it's a, a planar mechanism here, but it's got two uh, constraints that uh, intersect at this point. So its degree of freedom is a rotation. If I could draw it, a red line coming out at you um, that uh, can rotate. And you could imagine how that would move. Um, since it's constrained here, it would rock around this instant center. Okay. The interesting thing, though, is as I make these more and more parallel, that instant center gets pushed up further and further. So I'll show this again. See how it gets pushed up further and further, and, and this guy's rocking until the point where it actually literally reaches infinity, and they are parallel. Okay, So the first weird thing to tell you is that according to projective geometry, lines that are parallel actually do intersect, they just intersect at infinity, right? So that's weird, right? Um, you know, it's kind of like uh, if you look down very long train tracks from a perspective standpoint, it looks like they touch at the horizon. But of course, you know, that's, that's nonsense. The train tracks, well, first of all, they're not perfectly straight. But, but secondly, um, you know, they, they, since they all remain in finite space, they are all really uh, parallel all the way. It's just the perspective makes it look like it intersects at infinity. But in this case, according to projective geometry, perfectly parallel lines that never start becoming less and less parallel, they literally intersect at a point at infinity. And um, this actually is more logical than uh, believing they don't ever intersect. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll show you, I'll make that proof later. But for now, uh, trust me that, uh, yes, what they taught you in kindergarten is wrong. Uh, parallel lines do intersect. They just intersect at infinity, okay? And um, you could imagine if this uh, in, you know, at point of intersection is at infinity, if that rotational axis is infinitely far away, then it would manifest, its rotation would manifest as a, as a pure translation, which is exactly what happens when you have this parallel guide mechanism with two parallel wires or two parallel blades there, they, they constrain the stage so that its only degree of freedom is a translation perpendicular to them. Okay, so, um, and, and, and that's the synonymous with a rotation infinitely far away. Okay. Okay, so the point of this is to prove to you that a translation is a rotation at infinity. All right. So let's, let's prove this another way, okay? Imagine you have this block here and there's an axis of rotation coming out at you and it's rotating like that and then you start moving it further and further away from the block but you're still rotating around that axis. Here's how the block's motion would correspond if there's the axis of rotation. If that's the twist vector with a pitch of zero coming out at you like this, um, it would uh, start moving like this and you can see the further and further it gets away from you, the less kind of rotation-ness it has to it, right? The closer it is, it's really rotating about a tight curve there, but the further away it gets, it kind of starts looking a little bit more like it's translating till if this point actually reaches infinity, it's not approaching infinity, it reaches infinity, this is a pure translation, okay? So that's, that's one way to, to look at it. Um, 
And, uh, you know, as long as that point is still in finite space, it still has a little bit of rotation with a certain curvature, um, you know, a radius of curvature of that rotation. Um, but the second that point reaches infinity, that uh, radius of curvature is, that, 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 you know, moment arm from that point to this point here is infinite, and therefore it's a pure translation. Okay? So that's another proof there. So let, let's do another interesting thought experiment here. So say you have this curving spline line here, and um, if you want to know what the curvature at any point is along that line, say you want to know the curvature at that point, then you draw a circle that's tangent to that spline line at that point, and you define its radius, and that is the radius of curvature, okay? And, and, and the curvature, by definition, is uh, 1 divided by that radius, rho, okay? So that means things that are really curvy, has a high curvature, have a low uh, or a small radius of curvature. So this guy's really small, so 1 divided by something small is large. But as it gets less curvature, less curvy, right, then, then rho gets larger and curvature gets smaller until finally, um, what happens when rho or the radius of curvature is infinite? Well, when rho or the radius of curvature is infinite, when it literally reaches infinity, then you know 1 divided by infinity is perfect 0, right? And uh, therefore, it has 0 curvature. If curvature is 0, 0 curvature, and what has 0 curvature? Well, a line, okay? So that, uh, by definition, a line is linear, has 0 curvature, okay? So it's linear, right? So, so um, okay, so, so really what we proved here is that a line is really a circle with an infinite radius, okay? And that, that explains a lot. That explains why lines don't have a beginning or end. You'd think, well, you know, it's a geometric... Uh, uh, thought, you know, or it's, it's just a concept of geometry is really what a line is. And, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to imagine it has a beginning or end, and it really doesn't have a beginning or end because it's really a circle with an infinite radius. And that's what a line is, and a circle doesn't have a beginning or end, right? Um, so, okay, so a line is a circle with an infinite radius. That's, um, that's an interesting point. Uh, let's look at another interesting point. Um, a sphere, um, or, or let's put it this way, a plane, a perfect plane, is really a sphere with an infinite radius. Okay, so, you know, the reason the world, a lot of people, you know, it looks flat to people, um, you know, is because it's got a really large radius of curvature, and so one divided by that large radius of curvature makes it look like it has a very small curvature. Okay, um, but of course the world is uh, spherical, and, uh, and it has some finite thing, and so it's, it's definitely not flat. But if it were an infinite radius, then the world would indeed be perfectly flat. That's the definition of a plane, is a sphere with an infinite radius. Okay? So this works, the reason I show you this is this works over multiple dimensions. Um, you know, a circle is a, a one-dimensional thing, uh, you know, and a plane is a two-dimensional thing. Um, uh, well, no, sorry, a, a line is one dimensional thing, the circle is a two dimensional thing, the, the plane is a two dimensional thing, and the sphere is a three dimensional thing. So, so anyway, it, it works across dimensions here. Okay, so, um, okay, let, let's look at another weird thought. So, let, let's look at this kind of in 3D. Remember, I, I had this, uh, you know, I pulled this rotation line infinitely far away this way and it manifested once it reaches infinity. Once this is infinity, it's a translation. So that's like saying, you know, imagine it rotating like this, pull it away, rotate like this, pull it away, rotate like this, and then when it reaches infinity, it's just straight up and down, okay? So that, that's exactly right. Uh, when a rotation is pulled to infinity, perpendicular to that axis of rotation, is a, it, it manifests as a translation, okay? It's the same thing. Okay, but wait a minute. What if we pull the line this way? So what if... What if I take this and start, you know, thinking of rotating it back like this, and it reaches infinity, now it's still the same translation. So that's really weird, because it's like that's, that looks like a very different line than the other line, and yet two different lines seem to map to this same degree of freedom. Um, okay, but it gets even weirder and worse, because if you pull it this way, so now say, 
you take this and you think of it rotating like this, and you pull it, and by the time it reaches infinity, this is a, a translation. It's the same thing. You pull it in this direction, and you get the same perpendicular translation. And it's the same this way, right? If you pull it this way, now you think of the rotation like this, like that, and you pull it that way, it rotates like that, you pull it this way, until it finally reaches infinity, and now it's a translation. So it's like, well, hold, hold on. You know, these are, these are four different lines, and we pull them to infinity, and they both manifest as the same translation. What's going on there? Like, you know, one degree of freedom should be the same thing. If there's a one-to-one -one mapping, um, then they should be the same, right? But, but uh, and here's the resolution, is these four lines are not four different lines. They are actually a single line, which is a circle with an infinite radius. Okay, so, so uh, even though I've drawn these as you know, lines that are tangent to the circle. There's no such thing as lines tangent to a circle when the circle has an infinite radius because that circle is no longer circular, has no curvature, it's a straight line and, and it's collinear with those four lines and they're, it's incorrect to think of them as four different lines, they're one and the same line. Okay, which is, which is nice because um, this is just one single translational degree of freedom and it should really just map to one rotation at infinity and all these four lines or any other direction you could have pulled it in um, are really just one and the same line which is a circle with an infinite radius and you could think about it you know um, as you rotate around this uh, this circle which is called a hoop this is a red hoop as you rotate it would spew everything out uh, this way or go up and down depending on the direction imagine rotating that hoop everything inside moves up or down like a translation. Okay, so, okay, so the conclusions of this is that, you know, um, a line at infinity is really a circle with an infinite radius, or really any line is a circle with an infinite radius, but if, if that line is all at infinity, um, then you'd like to, you, you should think of it as a red hoop, um, if it's a red line, right? Um, and, and uh, you know, and it's, it's a circle with an infinite radius, okay? And that uh, is equivalent to a translation uh, in finite space that is perpendicular essentially to the plane of this hoop, okay? So if, if it's a direction that's orthogonal or perpendicular to the plane of that hoop, that's the translation that, you know, maps to that uh, uh, circle with an infinite radius or a line, okay? Okay, so just to bend your mind even more, you know that two intersecting planes always intersect at a line, right? So here's two intersecting planes that intersect at this line. Well, as you make these planes more parallel, you can see that line gets pushed until finally they are parallel and it's, it now is pushed to infinity, okay? So, so you can kind of think, um, if you've got these planes, as they become more and more parallel, that, that uh, point of intersection zips up to infinity. Or sorry, that line uh, where they intersect zips to infinity. So it is true that two planes always intersect at a line even when they are parallel. Um, and this is, the new, this is the projective geometry aspect of it. And Euclidean geometry is like, well, no, you know, once they're parallel, they don't, they don't intersect. But according to projective geometry, no, they absolutely do. When they're parallel, they intersect um, at, uh, still at a line. They always intersect a line, but that line is out at infinity. But the weird thing is, is what about in that direction? They, they, they're just as parallel in that direction, infinitely far out, and so they intersect there too, and they're just as parallel in this direction out and in that direction. So, you know, you think, well, gosh, if they intersect at a line when they're parallel, and they're parallel, just as parallel in any direction, so they intersect at infinity in any direction, do they intersect at four unique lines? These four lines? No, and you could keep going on. You could say, well, what about another line out here? Or what about, a, you know? Um, no, those are not uh, a, a unique number of lines. That's just a single line, which is a circle with an infinite radius. Okay, so, so um, you know, planes that intersect um, in finite space intersect at a line. And then planes that are parallel intersect at a line, which is best visualized as a circle with an infinite radius, which is what a line is. Okay? 
Okay, so now let's, let's go back a dimension here. Let's look at these just two lines that intersect at this point. Um, as they become more and more parallel, you can see that line moves away until, it, until they are parallel and that point reaches infinity. Well, when you just look at lines, you could say, well, they're just as parallel in this direction. Don't, don't they intersect that point in that direction too? Because you could do the exact same case study but open them up the other way, right? Instead of the, the point zipping there to infinity, you could do that same thing in reverse and open it up in that way until it reaches infinity. So, have we now found some magical case? I mean, we know as long as lines aren't skew, uh, if they ever lie on the same plane, then they always intersect at a point. Well, what if they're parallel? Well, they still intersect at a point, but did we just prove that they intersected two different points? No, that's not the case. Lines always intersect at a point. Um, and projective geometry, you can absolutely prove that the point at positive infinity is the same point as negative infinity. They're one and the same point. Okay, and there's this whole textbook um, ab about uh, how positive infinity is the same point as negative infinity. Okay, and you can actually, um, you can see that, um, a, 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 you know, if I were to draw a, um, well, here, let's see if I actually can draw this. Uh, Okay, so, oops, okay, so, let's see if you can see this, yeah, so, okay, so you can imagine, okay, if this is, uh, or here, let's do black, okay, so imagine a number line where this is you know, this goes out positive direction, this goes out in the negative direction. So this is zero. This is like one, that's two, that's three, and this is negative one, negative two, negative three. Well, you could think of this number line like it's a circle. Okay, maybe I'm drawing below. Here, can you see that point? Well, anyway, imagine a circle here where at the bottom of the circle uh, you have plus infinity and negative infinity. Okay? Here, let me move this down. Okay, so, yeah, so here, here you have, um, you know, if you imagine this straight line as really a circle with an infinite radius, uh, then it's really a straight number line, right? Because any circle with an infinite radius is a line. And if you go this way, it's positive until it gets to the bottom of the circle, there's positive infinity. Then you go this way, and it's negative infinity. Okay, so you can see both positive and negative infinity are the exact same point on a number line that's really a circle with an infinite radius, okay? Okay, so that's why if you go out in the positive direction, the negative direction, by the time you reach, you know, if, if you and your buddy, you know, started at some point and, and he walked uh, that direction, um, you know, to infinity, and then I walked this direction to infinity, we eventually, if we were ever able to reach infinity, which is, of course, impossible, we would run into each other, okay? All right, so. Okay, now let me see, make sure this is, uh, make sure you can see the full thing again here. Okay, so, so there we are. So, okay, so that, that's kind of a, a way to think about um, proving that positive and negative infinity are the same point, so, um, of course, two lines that are on the same plane will always intersect at a single point, whether they intersect in finite space or at infinity um, if they're parallel, okay? Either at positive or negative infinity, same point, okay? So that means positive and negative infinity are the same point because lines are circles with infinite radius. So another reason they, you can think they loop is because, you know, this, this point on this line and this point on this line or end up being the same point because they're circles with infinite radii, okay? So this also works if you think about it in 3D. Think of, um, think of a box, this is called a bundle in projective geometry of, of parallel lines here. It's just, imagine this is infinitely large box and there's just, this represents all lines that are parallel in a certain direction. Well, they all intersect, just like two parallel lines on the same plane intersect at the same point at infinity they all intersect at the same point at infinity, right? And they also intersect at the same point at negative infinity uh, in the other direction. So it's kind of like, 
all the lines kind of collapse and intersect at one point, and they collapse at the other point at infinity, okay? So one way you can think about this, if, if this is unsettling to you, um, is think about a single point in space where all lines are going through that point. So it's like a big starburst of lines coming out from it. And then you take that shape, uh, you know, that, that point with all those lines coming, and you move it away from you so far that eventually all those lines that come pierce you are, are being more and more parallel until it's infinitely far away and they literally are parallel. This is why, you know, the rays of the sun, even though the sun, the rays of the sun are going out radially from the, the sun's center, right, in all directions, when you get far enough away from the sun that the rays of light that hit you are more and more parallel. And we're pretty far from the sun, so um, they're, I and mean, of course they're not perfectly parallel, but they're, they're getting parallel. If the sun were literally infinitely far away from us, if it reached infinitely far away, then the rays of the sun that hit us would be perfectly parallel. And that, that's a proof uh, that those parallel lines, if you just go the other direction, uh, eventually intersect at infinity in either, either direction. Okay? And again, that, that point and that point are the same point, so they only intersect at one point. Okay? So... <clears throat> Uh, the other thing to realize is, you know, we, we did the proof for two planes. Um, as they open up and become more and more parallel, uh, they intersect a point that, or a line that gets pushed further and further away until they are parallel and they intersect at this line that's a circle with an infinite radius, which is, which is a line, right? Um, but you could do the same proof with any number of stacked parallel planes. For an infinite number of stacked parallel planes, they all intersect at the same line at infinity. It's like space kind of collapses and intersects at this line in all the directions, um, right? And, and you can kind of prove this to yourself by thinking of, of, of many planes drawn intersecting a single, like, line, and then they all open up at the same rate so that they still intersect by the point of intersection so it's getting pushed up. And then when they all become parallel, that same line is snapped to infinity, and it's a hoop. Um, Right? It's, it's this hoop that's an infinitely large circle uh, with an infinite radius. Still a line, therefore. Right? So, so basically, all planes uh, that are parallel uh, intersect the same line. Okay, so all these things are, so you're thinking, like, how in this world can this apply to mechanism design? Well, I'm about to show you here, but before I do, let me show you the math kind of behind this proving that if you take a rotation and pull it to infinity, it'll, it'll manifest as a pure translation once it reaches infinity. So um, this math is very doable. It's not uh, crazy math here. So say you have, uh, so that you see the coordinate system x, y, and z, and say I pull out this translation, or sorry, this, this rotational twist uh, with a pitch of zero, so it's a red pure rotation, some distance d away along the y-axis, and it's parallel to the x-axis, okay? But it's, it's on the plane of the x-y-axis, okay? Um, so let's, let's define its twist for a finite d. Well, its, it's c-vector would be, or at least one of its possible c-vectors, is 0, d, 0, right? And that, that points right there to that point. It could point anywhere along that, as you know, but you might as well do the easy one. Okay, and then uh, the omega vector would be, let's just give it a magnitude of omega 1, 0, 0. And then that, that means it points in this direction with that magnitude. That's the angular velocity vector. And then, of course, the pitch is 0 because it's a rotation. Okay, so if we do that and we construct a twist with, those, with those, this information, you take the first three components of the omega, that's the first three, then the last three components, you say c cross omega plus p times omega, which is, you know, zero. So, so it's just c cross omega is the last three. And so here is the omega. You can see it's the same three components here. Uh, and then this is c cross omega is that. And you should do your math and check that, okay? So, so you have this twist vector um, that describes this, this twist. Well, what happens when d goes to infinity, when it gets pushed infinitely far away from this the, you know, the center of all finite space is the coordinate system, right? So say d reaches infinity. Well, if d reaches infinity, you know, a twist is nonsense unless it has finite values, right? It has to be real finite values for the twist to mean anything. So if d goes to infinity, what does omega 1 have to be? 
the scalar value of omega 1? Well, it has to be 0 to make this a finite value because remember, infinity times 0 can be finite. It, it can be some uh, real finite number of, of any, any value you want, right? So when d goes to infinity, for this to be any meaningful twist at all, it has to manifest, omega now has to, has to be 0 which means this omega has to be 0, too. So that means this twist converts into 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, some finite real value C1. OK? So that's what happens to the twist when d becomes infinity, is that this has to all be 0, which means the first three, it's 0 rotation in it, the first three of the rotation. And then the last three are the translations of the coordinate system. And it says there's 0 translation in x, 0 translation in y, and then some translation in z. Okay, so that means if you take a, uh, a rotation twist, the pitch of zero, right, that's parallel to x, and it's distance d out, and you make d go to infinity, that rotation will manifest as a translation in z. Okay, which is exactly what we would expect. So that's what the math tells you, and that's what we would expect once d reaches infinity. Okay? All right, so there's your, there's your translation here. It's perpendicular to. Okay, so, so I showed you uh, math kind of proof that this is the case, and I, I taught you some really strange things um, that are absolutely true, um, and, and not only consider finite space but infinite space. That's the problem with Euclidean geometry is that it really doesn't consider things, it doesn't consider infinity. Projective geometry does consider infinity and recognizes that things do... Uh, intersect um, at infinity and have these uh, amazing consequences, right? So let's, let's look at um, how this could possibly apply to uh, flexures and, and mechanisms in general, all this crazy stuff I just taught you. Well, um, all right, this brings us to the last topic of this lecture, okay, which is the rule of complementary patterns, okay? So first of all, um, let's, just, let's just do a quick review, and then I'll tie it in with, with uh, projective geometry. Um, say I gave you this mechanism, and I said this is ground and that's ground, and I asked, is this a parallel or serial system? Well, hopefully you'd say it's a parallel system, because it's, you know, these two grounds are really one ground. So you've got two rigid bodies, the stage and the ground, and they're directly connected by these wire flexures. Okay, so it's a parallel system, so it can't be under constraint as a review. Okay, and I'm telling you, it is exactly constrained, okay? If, so it, it's definitely uh, not under constrained, um, but it is not over constrained either. It is exactly constrained, is, is what I'm telling you, meaning these wire flexures are uh, non-redundant. They're all essential, okay? So that means how many degrees of freedom would you expect it to have? Well, you can use Maxwell's equation 6 minus 5 because there's 5 wires equals 1. So there should be just a single degree of freedom. And uh, I would recommend you put things on pause and visualize. Can you visualize what that degree of freedom would be? Okay. Um, if you can't, another thing you could do is you could CAD this um, and then do a modal analysis and you'll find um, all the mode shapes, second, you know, the lowest natural frequency mode shape is this. And it has by far the lowest natural frequency. All the other natural frequencies are much higher because uh, they correspond to mode shapes that are constrained. Okay, so this is the degree of freedom that we would expect. And you could say, well, where, okay, that's weird. And you can see it, it's like rocking. That's, an under, that's not a constrained direction. Um, that's the only not constrained direction. Everything else is constrained, right? Um, and you could see it's actually rotating around this axis, okay? So here we draw the, you saw we drew the blue constraint lines which are just geometric identifiers, you know, they, they go through the axes of each of the five constraints and they, they go on forever. Those are the blue constraint lines. Okay, and then here's the, the red rotation line that, that is the uh, mode, the first natural frequency mode shape and therefore should be the degree of freedom. Okay, the question is, what is the relationship between the blue lines and the red line? Well, I, you know, this was, I learned this from Douglas Blanding who wrote um, his book on exact uh, you know, constraint machine design, um, uh, and that's not the exact title, but um, it's, it's something like that. He wrote his, his book on exact constraint um, in machine design, and he said, you know, he recognized there's these red lines and these uh, rotation lines and these uh, constraint lines, 
and he said the relationship between them can be defined using the rule of complementary patterns. That's a rule he 